Hey, welcome to Puffcast. My guest is Luca Vines. He's a young filmmaker discussing the making of his two short films. A Ball of Mania is a unique experimental film which incorporates elements of music video. This is actually based on someone he knows living with a rare cognitive disease that affects their decision making every day. And show business. This is a retributive film based on ambitious, narcissistic industry ladder climbers who are perfect fodder for villains with an inevitable demise. We also discuss the absurd saturation of film festivals these days and the monopolization of the film submission process. Luke is a cool dude, full of cool ideas. And he's got the right energy and determination to bring them all to life. Enjoy the conversation and support the channel. Thanks for listening. See you on the next one. Ciao for now. Hey man, how are you? I'm good, thanks for having me on here, yeah. Nice to meet you. Yeah, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? I, much like a lot of people in this industry, got started uh, sort of in my younger years doing media creation and stuff, and then after I graduated, I want to be a cop actually, but oh. then I uh, went, nah, and uh, went on to uh, go into doing media. I just out of uni after a year, graduated last year as well with a Bachelor of Media and Communications, but uh, you know. So you've got some film education? Yeah. What are your influences film-wise? A lot of my influences, and you'll see if you watch a few of my films, don't come from a lot of movies, but we'll get into the movies in a second. A lot of my, my influences come from music or various strange artists or photography i just seen around from the board, people that I interact with in my everyday life that I'll explain in my films in a second, and mm. just sort of oddball concepts that I get spat at. And in regards to like style and stuff... Uh, I look at a lot of uh, Lars von Trier, his experimental and sort of more horrific side to how he makes his films. Todd Phillips, of course, which is, he just made the new Joker as well, which... Oh, I haven't seen that. Um, people are crapping all over it. And I just looked at it and I went, that's exactly what I expected from Todd Phillips. I am so in love with it. I yeah. Just, I love it. It's look, so strange. Film <laughs> review shouldn't even be a job, really. Like... <sighs> Now we have like zillions when we, we had David and Margaret once upon a time. Everyone's <laughs> we were an quite, expert. Quite credible, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, the last good uh, reviewer I feel like that we had was Roger Ebert. I mean, I feel like just he was the person that was at least not up his own ass enough to sort of passively yeah. view things, but I enjoyed him in any. Okay, I'm not sure it. who that is, but. You know, when, when I, I ran festivals for, for a long time and rev and everything and having movie reviewers, we had one movie review, I won't drop a name, but he literally stood in front of everybody at the preview of this film and gave away the ending. Oh my God. <laughs> and he sat behind me and I turned around and went, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh. But, you know, uh, so film reviews, I don't read them, uh, you know, I've... I remember when Rotten Tomatoes came out oh, years ago, and now the now they're thing. an institution, you know. I mean, that Rotten Tomatoes was a thing. Like I remember just back in high school when that was somewhat looked upon with a positive light. You know, it takes the average of the people viewing it, but now it's been re it's been like revealed that Rotten Tomatoes has been uh, like basically lobbied where people can pay for reviews because it impacts yeah, look, the, box office. And I'm like, that's weird. I don't like that. The corruption happens in the arts when untalented un entrepreneurs see, a, you know, sees uh, an opportunity. And it's, it's always people that don't make art that make the most out of art. You know, artists yeah. have more integrity. So I think, you know, people who review art or film or whatever should go out and fucking make one. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, I mean, but they're coming from an audience perspective, I suppose. These but, are topics that I do touch on in show business, so I'm sure we'll have an entertaining talk with that when we come around to sure. it. Sure. Uh, 
Um, okay, so I'm mean, interested. Yeah, influences given your um, your generation. What um, uh, I mean, just just name some films. Oh, and... name some films. Well, I do top, take top five. Oh, Jesus, top five. I'm just such a. I'll give a few animation and a few live action. Yeah. Animation, The Incredibles. I think oh, that, yeah. that cops it out. Uh, right. Into the Spider Verse as well. Yeah, I, I, just think I that's best of the decade. I dig that. What, what about um, Marvel What If? Did you like those? Oh, uh, Marvel What If? I think a couple of the episodes really like stuck with me. The Doctor Strange one where he's that I loved that it. was fantastic. But the, the zombies, which was a true, it was just was like a, a ode to the uh, the comics Comic, that yeah. came out, you know. And then they, I thought the What If series. was I fantastic. really liked the art style, and I like seeing. I love the animation because I grew up on my dad's comics from the the forties to the sixties, yeah, yeah. and so. I grew up reading these characters and now I'm seeing them properly for the first time be adapted into live action and TV and movies and stuff. And I'm like, that's fantastic. I mean, I still own the first issue of when Black Panther turned up in the Fantastic Four. Oh, oh and cool. that's who I grew up with. And yeah. him turning up in Civil War was that moment for me where I was like, shit, this is exactly what yeah. I've been doing that. And What If does a lot of that because I have a lot of those original mm. comics at the... Mm the what if episodes are based off of and Mm. I'm like that's just really freaking cool well from a Gen X point of view I mean I I was I grew up in the times when these things were actually emerging and they were highly highly influential so I mean I've got um, the first Marvel comics on tape up there which were literally like paper cutouts yeah animation you know but they still had my, a major impact. So for me to sort of watch that genre evolve into what it is now. But those characters always had that potential. In the 70s, they, they made uh, live action films of Spider-Man and, uh, and they're pretty, they're laughable. But at the time, you didn't really care about the special effects. It was all about the story and the yeah. action, you know. Well, I mean, if we are talking about superhero films, because I don't watch as many as I should, but there are a few key ones that I do draw inspirations from, particularly the Sam Raimi, uh, sorry, Spider-Man film specifically. A lot of my team draws from that because it's that side of silliness can override logic. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what a lot of people are tempted to get wrong nowadays is that, uh, you know, we're, we're in the indie scene. We know the amateur filmmakers. We know how stigmatized they are to being like it needs to have a perfectly written story it needs to make sense at all times and me and my team are over here just going yeah but if it's fun enough let's just you know yeah. bring that back yeah and f- so flexibility yeah and having that ability and that's why we really love watching some re- just really crass and crap movies and just going i want to do that yeah but in a better way and so yeah just uh, i mean other films i mean Classic pick, No Country for Old Men, obviously. Yeah. Uh, the new Blade Runner, twenty forty nine. That's an amazing film, I think. That's a, it's a certainly a work of art. Yeah. It had to be though, and because everybody... the first one. <laughs> I mean, you know, a sequel to Blade Runner. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed it, and I think it had a, the right atmosphere. You know, I think the 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 Dune reboots are, are really good too. I think that my dad's like favorite triple A films in the last twenty years. He says. Just purely based on sound design and spectacle, yeah, I hundred percent that their sound design win was worth it. I it's just it's and insane. visually, it's they're beautiful films visually as well. They I think it's a triumph, yeah. I think so too, because um, yeah, there's there's a there's a big long story behind the uh, you know the, the the making of June has went through all sorts of shit to mainly the first film yes <laughs> yeah 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 and that that is the one i know off by heart yeah. i watched that over and over again despite the flaws um <laughs> but uh but I, I think it's been rebooted pretty well those worms are just fantastic i mean just everything about it i went damn there's not much to complain about here they really hit every point yeah. Just on the mark. Yeah. I think that was great. Yeah. I think also it's about respecting the work. Yeah, definitely. The author and, and all of that and finding the balance between film and book, you know, yeah. and achieving that. Um, 
Cool. So um, these short films you've made, yeah. um, what was your first film experience? Uh, like making your first film, which, what was it? First film it of note, because we all have like the first couple that are like, whatever. First film of note was the original concept for show business was about a year ago when we were graduating, we made Cut, which was a short film, filmmakers killing their actors, that was quite popular actually it sort of got just picked up by a bunch of uh perth film festivals and just different groups of people that we had brought onto the project and was just shared out and it's still something i get stopped on the street for nowadays of just like oh shit you made that film really? I'm like yeah it was it's something weird it's like one of those films where the online view count doesn't really represent how many people have watched it oh, because yeah. we screened it like 30 times in the last year just not even trying, just sort of like someone's like, hey, can we screen this? And we're like, yeah, sure. Oh, okay. And so we filled out like the cinema for it like 20 times with like, you know, various other films Which cinema? as well. Mostly Luna. Luna. Uh, Backlot's been a few times. Um, yeah. The rooftop cinema in, I don't remember where. Oh, uh, the city. Yeah, that one. We've done that a bunch and Fringe. it's just been, yeah, just really bizarre ones. Some like well, people's me, um, backyards and shit. Let me read out the synopsis. Approached by the handler. Ethan Powell is requested to come work for a mystery filmmaker. Upon turning it down and returning to his abusive wife, Ethan's life is turned upside down in his pursuit of show business. So what inspired this story? Yeah, so the major thing was trend because you have to keep in mind this was um made in the effort to in service of the feature effectively not that we weren't trying with this one it was just more like how will this help the viewing experience with the feature and so we were going what are the major themes and sort of things with the big feature and the biggest thing was we're expanding the concept we're incorporating more people and the film the show business and the feature are more direct attack is a strong word but harsh stern look at uh the pursuit of show business that indie filmmaking can reach because as i've gone and I, as i've turned professional with my filmmaking i've noticed more and more really bad people that are in the film scene and going like i've seen these people go from start to where they are now and what bad stuff they've had to do to get there and I went let's turn that concept up to like 20 of where we go the characters in this are all killers they're all like uh angry a thousand times like constantly all day they're threatening and they're so you know you've, you've made them like extremists yeah and they're all you know they will do anything in pursuit of show business which usually equates to mass murder which is what we you see in that film and you'll see in the feature and we did in cut one cut one was more just in a joking sense like haha this is a crazy filmmaker and now that we're launching into the feature we're treating it much more like the harrowing concept that it would be in real life and that's sort of what that is soft introducing so your experience in the film scene has uh has has inspired you to make a short film based on your experiences but turn them into more extremities yeah i mean if it's worth doing it's worth overdoing and that's also not saying you know everyone's bad you know it's the the one percent that ruins it for everybody as mentioned but the film takes the stance that mm. everybody is terrible and it's like that's what people have enjoyed with that and the good life and cut and stuff alike. Mm. If that's what you enjoy, you know, we'll keep, you know, we'll keep building this world up. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was just sort of what me and my co-director, Ash and Crompton on the first cut film, were angry about at the time. We'd had a problem with somebody. And while we were making the film, we were like, fuck him, let make him the villain. And we're just going to make this film. And we oh. made the film. So it was ba the vi main villain was based on a specific person who nobody knows who that is. Sure. So uh, does, I don't even think they work in the film industry anymore. So it's like not a big deal. But it was just like 
at the time we were pissy, so we turned somebody into a villain. And that's the best. That's the best revenge. Yeah. Um, I've done something similar in the past where people have tried to nick my IP and failed, and have they've had to pay me. <laughs> so, uh, expressing your frustrations through art is the best way to do it. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you go to jail <laughs> for <Yeah>. being a. <laughs> well, it, that was the interesting thing. We originally went into the first one with going. Uh, we're so we're so pissy, and then like two weeks weeks into making that, we forgot all about why we were pissy, and we were just like, oh, we're just having fun with it now. And so the film now, the feature and everything isn't directed at anybody specifically because that's stupid. It's more directed at a collective idea of oh. how far will people you know, go. will people go for their art. Well, I can give you some input into that. Um, yeah. But they are good fodder for villains. They are. You know, so... Well, let's read out your methodology here. <clears throat> This film was made in the shadow of the Take 48 challenge, but took life of its own after the team behind it felt that it needed a full short film dedication to it. Show Business is the third short film made in the Cut saga, leading up to the feature film Cut to Black, Warland, that is set to be released at the end of 2024. Show Business introduces an entirely new cast of characters to expand on both individually and help provide further structure and world building as well as be damn entertaining. This was filmed in one day and edited across 48 hours, seeing a large success online and popularity across the board with viewers and fans of the Cup saga. So t tell me about the Take 48 challenge. Yeah, that was something where... So the both short films, both additional short films, A Good Life and Show Business, didn't plan to do them. Then my producer, Piper Stancer, sent me links to the Take 48 challenge and is this other... Australian filmmaking thing which was like one of them was make a short film in 30 days one was make a short film in two days uh, both of them would you two days from when she sent that email and I went you reckon we could do them both and she went yeah so we made we shot both of them in two days with our teams and then just edited sent them off uh, they didn't like it because uh, fair play honestly mm. because we even though we made it for the challenge it was, that wasn't the point, that wasn't the objective was to win the challenge because the challenge is like, the Take 48 is very heavily focused on comedy. It's about getting an audience reaction. Whereas our film was built to service a greater feature film so it wouldn't land and stuff. And that wasn't something that we personally put that much effort into. It was just a good excuse to make the film, if you sure. know what I mean. And then they, did, they didn't have enough uh, that it was sort of like if you make it you screen it but then they took everybody's money and then said we don't actually have enough uh, screening positions booked so we're not going to screen like half the films what? and it was over in Sydney and a bunch of people flew over just to find out sorry we don't have enough cinemas booked so yours are uh... not going to be screened and everybody went what the fuck <laughs> and so I'm just like yeah so you know I'm not, uh... not too stressed that that place doesn't really like what I have to do so but, um, Here's the thing, like I was doing this back in the day before the internet and then the internet came along and things, you know, changed and got a little bit easier. But now um, it's just so easy to produce a so-called film festival yeah. and, uh, and, and wing it, basically. Um, I'm a, I'm a fairly large critic of Film Freeway, given that it's a complete monopolization. Yeah. Um, but also, it's infinite scrolling of registered film festivals. A lot of registered film festivals. Yeah, but how many of them are any good? Not like, many of them. Exactly. So it's a good money spinner, you know. Um, but 
but also what surprised me about Film Frio when I used it to enter a film is that it uses US currency. Um, uh, and, uh, and I thought that was a bit strange. Yeah, but I mean, sense. you've got to have a, f you know, to enter film festivals now, it's easier but you've got to have a lot of money because they're all about 50 to 70 bucks a pop. It's, it's a, we, when we did the first car film, because we were getting aware of that because how many people like, how, how many filmmakers have you met that go, I'm an award winning director. And I'm like, what award was that? Yeah. And they were like, oh, it's for this. Like the one blah, shot blah, in blah, India where there was, yeah, was like yeah. BS. But I mean, I feel like the only benefit ones are ones in your country yeah. and better in your state. It's like the only ones that we put on our posters and stuff. Cause sometimes we do festival runs because, um, our films have been popular in Indonesia, yeah. um, and Tokyo quite a lot just because they specifically like the action and the blood that we do. So we have okay. specific contact with yeah. actual festivals yeah. and, one of my directors was over in Japan when it got screened, so he got to turn up for the screening, and that was like a re like an actual interaction yeah, cool. and an actual festival. So that yeah, was great. Yeah. But like, for the first cut film, we submitted to like fucking a hundred of these things yeah, right. as a joke, and because we went, let's see how many BS festivals we can get to give us an award, and we got I think probably upwards of seventy. Oh. And so <laughs> the poster was just. I'll fucking I'll show you a photo it is just like pfft, wall to wall and people were like oh my god congratulations and I'm like no it was a joke and like that, that's we weren't being serious about this but um, and that was really funny because for the film about critiquing you know this like, is exactly what I'm talking exactly. about it, it, this is exactly. that was, it was a joke like <laughs> leave this us alone. is exactly what I'm talking about I mean how many it's just, it's just it's such yeah that was that was what the poster ended up looking like <laughs> and we had so many more as well to go along with it and it was like that <laughs> and people were like that is oh, hilarious oh, you're so accomplished it and must I'm like, be an no, awesome was, film it's like, no that was the joke it's yeah. not a good film because, that was the point <laughs> because there's so there's an infinite amount of them now yeah exactly and they can't all be organised or you know like um, but also you've got the fact that because it's high competition, like they just need content mm. and they could be just choosing anything anytime it turns up, you know, like who's, um, it's gone fucking crazy. I did, I didn't use film freeway for the experimental film event. Cause I just went, okay, well just cut and paste his information and email it to me. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's move on to your other film. A Bullomania. Yeah, the most unpronounceable title in the world. Um, Not really, you so, just got to get your, you know. Yeah, <laughs> so I made this one for a few specific reasons. One was I was wanting to kickstart something that I'm still passively keeping an eye on of making films about sort of demonising... Uh, not demonizing, but as in putting light onto really specific medical conditions. You ever seen like Dr. House or something? Or like Grey's Anatomy or something? Where... Um, no, not, I know what they are. Yeah, well, but, there's no. stuff in those shows where you will see medical cases come through that there is like one in six million people have it. And it's like this specific person has it. And every single episode, there's a new case of like oh, this hyper specific disease. Rare. And it's like... Well, obviously that's not how real hospitals run, but whatever. And so one of my mates has a diagnosed a bullomania, which is the inability and medical inability to make decisions big or small in your everyday life. And I thought about that and I went, that'd be really interesting. So I, I got an under the table interview and I just went like, tell me about it. And he was just basically like, it's so much harder when... He made an example that you see in the film of where he went to, you know, when you go down to like strip of fast food places like Macca's, Hungry Jack's, KFC, Chicken Street. And he goes, it's so much harder when they're so similar. He says it's a lot easier when everything's different because he oh, went, you can differentiate places, a lot easier. Yeah. And he says, I go to all these places and functionally to me, they all feel the same. Yeah. Even though I know they're different, they're, I, I can't make a they're decision. They're formulated the same. Exactly. Yeah. And he says, I have a hard time choosing what to drink. If I'm at a bar, I have a hard time like oh. um, 
uh, choosing music or movies and right. food. And those are all stuff that you see in the movie as well. Like our main character, she... Uh, also, what to wear when he gets dressed. He, he compared it to that our old thing that Albert Einstein used to say where he has only white t-shirts so that he doesn't have to like waste his brain power on it. But like my mate was just going... Uh, who I just won't mention his name, and he just goes, you know, I just, I'll just stand there for like an hour, just like, I can't decide what to put on, basically. So he just, he has just this plain ass wardrobe. And I'm like, that's weirdly horrifying if you're effectively just immobilized because you can't. Is this something your your friend uh, had at birth or did it develop in time? It's a developing thing. Uh, It's, he said he got it when he was 20 ish, as it's more of an. An autonomous thing is you become uh, more isolated in your life because yeah. then decisions fall on you. You don't have a parent to make a decision for you. You don't have a teacher making a decision for you. He says sometimes you see it in people who are ex-military who used to have um, like drill sergeants that would tell them, you know, a restricted schedule if here's exactly what you do. Uh, he says that that's just more presumptive, but he says it's similar to that. And... And I'm like, yeah, that sounds fucking scary. Let's make a film about it. And we didn't portray it. It We wanted originally to do it in a specific horror way, but I was adapting to a new editing style. And so I went more, let's just make it more spacey and sort of like we're trapped in your head kind of vibe where it's like neurons are firing. It's hard to tell what's happening. And I attempted to make a visual representation of what chaos looks like in his head and he looked at it and went it's great oh and yeah he went that's obviously not what it looks like but he's like that's kind of what it feels like where it's like everything's just changing and he's weird as shit yeah and it also landed really well with people we got like people who've previously hated all my previous stuff went this is fucking great and I'm like cool I did it in like six hours so leave me alone okay that was another one that we just smashed out in one night with my producer who acted also acted and it was just like me and her just Knocked it out, and uh, yeah, people fucking loved it's it. It's got a really good flow to it, I think. Have you seen it? Yeah, I've watched it a couple of times. Yeah, I really, I spent a lot longer on the edit, just with all of the visuals and stuff like that. And, my and brother, it's almost, it's half a music video yeah. as well, so you've incorporated, it kind of takes a turn. Yeah, because we, I have a background in music videos as well. Obviously, it wasn't <coughs> built to be a music video, but once I got into the editing suite, my brother Noah who you hear his music and see his face on the TV screen. We shot a promo for him. We just chucked that up there. Oh, and then okay. um, for his song, um, it wasn't amends. I don't remember what the song was. Oh, sorry. No, I forget. That's but, okay. um, <laughs> but yeah, I just went, I think this emotion just comes across exactly on the song. Because when we went on a drive, I went, I've got this film coming out. And he just gave me his new album and went, pick a song. And I grabbed that one and it... Yeah, it perfectly just matches. I think so too. And I, I think the, the the sort of unexpected change of, of the film that goes into music um, is just u- kind of a unique strategy, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it was it was sort of a, a zero, zero-sum film of where we just went, we shot this for nothing in no time. It's not a big deal if nobody likes it. I want to see what I can do with it. And even though it didn't get watched very much because it doesn't matter and like but the people that did watch it really loved it and mm. so I was like when Puff came along I was just like you know I'd actually like to screen this for once because you know yeah. we didn't plan to screen it or anything it was yeah. just like this has nobody's wanted to screen this before because it's fucking weird and so I went you know let's give it a shot Puff and yeah so yeah man, appreciate sure. that one being screened well let's um, I'll just read out the synopsis Plagued with a ball mania Tay is unable to make any decision in her daily life, big or small. As her sanity slips and her worldview crumbles, she seeks help from her friend to try to get her head back on straight. And uh, I'll just read out your methodology as well. Yeah. Written, filmed and edited in a single night as an experiment, a baller mania came about when Luca came across the mental condition in one of his friends and saw how debilitating it was. Instead of taking it to the extreme, Luca went about creating a psychedelic representation 
of what a lack of choice feels like. A constantly shifting but uncertain world. Too much choice, even in the most simple of situations. What to wear, what to eat, what to watch. These things were discussed and portrayed by Luca himself with the solo actor of Piper Stancer in a single very long night. You want to elaborate on some of that? No, I think it summarises it pretty well. It's just something that's hard to describe, and it's the type of thing where without that explanation, you would have no idea what the fuck is going on in the film. I believe so too, so yeah. Because as well, I didn't want it to be like a full medical diagnosis or anything. Uh, Not that I think that the story... That's always the tough thing. It's like judging how smart your audience is because that was something of where we've released both very exposition, very talky heavy films. Yeah. And then we've released films that are way more subtle. And the films that are way more subtle often get shat on more because what I'm, you know, I'm, I think I'm putting, I often put too much faith in that people be paying attention 100% of the time. Because if people are coming to see an indie film, They'll be on their phone, they're talking to their friends and stuff like that. And if you rely on your film to sort of hit the emotion at one line, then you're like, you know, if they per- if they miss that, they can do that. Like we had a film, Nicotine, that was a 30 minute stomp for it. And the people that watched it loved it. Hmm. Everybody else hated it because they were like, I don't know what's happening. And I'm like, no, you just didn't pay attention. But also I don't think it's their fault. I think it's just my fault. Like, okay, you know, we're not making a triple A film here, mm. we should probably be a bit more obvious so that people can watch this passively, if you know what I mean. They don't have to be laser focused on it. And so that's why we've done our feature film. We sure. had a bit more just obvious dialogue at times and, and reiterated a few points just so that the audience can at least be a bit more it's a bit more audience friendly, if you know what I mean. A bullet mania is not, but like that wasn't the point of it. It it's it's built to be an experiment and to test the grounds and see what sticks but people really loved it I think because it's shorter as well people don't have to pay attention for that long and so they pay attention they're like cool I understand what's happening I'm gonna go do my laundry now if you know Mm, what I mean mm, mm. well this is the the beauty of experimental film it's it's you know flexible um analyzing whether people watch things and for how long is a complete not a skull fuck for me but it seems like uh, your shorts have um, had some pretty good views and and some yeah. good feedback, and you're getting them out there. And uh... I mean, they definitely come and go at the moment. It's show business went a bit crazy. It's same with cut and uh, the good life went as well. Especially, I think because it's sort of developing into a soft IP because which we didn't originally plan for. It was originally just going to be the first short film, but then as we've made more, a lot more eyes have been put on it, and as well and different fields through our sponsors and just like our uh, various shares and the amount of actors and crew members we've had over 150 people working on wow. the feature uh just coming and going and just working and so it's like it's just exploded in terms of how many people are paying attention to what's happening which is really good yeah and it means that sort of the work that me and my crew are doing are it's on display it's not sort of going to waste i don't think which is nice it's sort of a bit disheartening in film when you put all that work in and mm. nothing happens. So what's the big picture for you? Oh, Jesus. Um, well, I just started a job that I don't think I can really talk about. But sure. I've been doing freelance media for um, the last year, and that's been my job. It's done pretty well. Uh, before that, I did a stint building a mining company's uh, uh, media department from scratch. That was Index Limited. I just went uh, unicorn and so just did their thing then left just did freelance media did this feature then that'll come out and who knows mm. probably still be sticking around here just making stuff make moves in the Perth music scene as well work with a lot of rappers one of our uh, artists we did a couple of music videos with Capes he just went uh, he's like Triple J unearthed artist twice in uh, Europe winner in 2022 2024 he went to the billboard charts as well his new song's going nuts and he was in sydney performing and shit so Hmm. it's really cool to see some of our people go big but you know 
I think that's uh, neither here nor there. I'd probably go for Gomez second though. Yeah. yeah. No, Boris, cool. Good talking to you. Nice oh, to yeah. meet you, man. Great to meet you as well. Thanks for that.